Many say the late 20th century is the age of information. No one has yet called it the age of wisdom. But with the advent of instant communications, ignorance is less of an excuse than it ever was. Nowhere is this more true than in the United States, where the communications industry has become the largest employer in the private sector. And generating information, not just delivering it, has become that industry's biggest job. In the old days, it was simply called the press. Today, it is more commonly referred to as the media, a gigantic industry gathering and distributing enormous quantities of news, data, and entertainment. To understand this complex creature, it's important to know something about its origins. Journalism got a late start in America. The new colonies didn't even have their own newspaper until almost a hundred years after European immigrants began arriving in the early 17th century. The early settlers, preoccupied with survival, received most of their news from London papers that came months late by sailing ship. When the first American newspaper was finally published in 1690, the British authorities promptly banned it the next day. The American colonies, unlike some newly emerging nations today, did not have to invent their own press system. They simply picked up where their English cousins left off. Only later would the colonial press take on a character all its own. The first American news stories were dry and often outdated, birth, death, and travel announcements laced with personal commentary. But they also carried important commercial news that the growing merchant class was willing to pay for. The first journalists, such as Ben Franklin, were actually printers who wanted an outlet for their prose and opinions. The English king, George III, required a license to print a newspaper in the colonies. A publisher who offended His Majesty's government could lose his license or be thrown in jail. That's just what happened to John Peter Zenger, a New York publisher who printed a series of political articles that led to charges from the crown of seditious libel. Zenger and his attorney convinced the jury that criticism of public officials is permissible if it is accurate. The case, some 40 years before America's War of Independence, set a precedent largely upheld by the courts today. Truth, if proven, is an absolute defense against libel. By the mid-18th century, the American press was a ragtag assortment of partisan publications in a half dozen cities along the Atlantic coast. Some were openly royalist. Fiercely opinionated, most colonial newspapers developed a profound distaste for British rule. Here, the Pennsylvania Journal registers its displeasure with the British Stamp Act, which particularly offended colonial publishers because it hit them in their pocketbooks. The Massachusetts spy openly advocated independence from the Crown at considerable risk. The newspaper's founder, Isaiah Thomas, became America's first war correspondent, noted for his lively dispatches from the Revolutionary Front. Having won independence, America's founders recognized the need to protect the press from government interference. They made freedom of the press a part of the First Amendment of the new Constitution. Thomas Jefferson, a key framer of the Constitution, saw the press as essential to any democracy. He said, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers, or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. This doesn't mean that Jefferson, George Washington, or other political leaders thought very highly of the press of their day. In truth, they usually detested what was written, especially about them. But instead of choosing censorship as a solution, 
they founded competing newspapers that supported their own political viewpoints. In those early days of the Republic, Americans took their politics seriously, and the press was right in the center of the fray. Here, a mob attacks the newspaper plant of an unpopular publisher. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, the press rapidly became a fixture of American life, particularly in the growing cities. European visitors were amazed at the number of newspapers in the new country, two or three times the number in England or France. There were 512 papers in the United States in 1820. With the development of the steam press and better quality paper, newspapers could be produced more quickly and in vastly larger numbers. They were written for the common citizen and sold to him at an affordable price. They called it the penny press. Higher literacy and an egalitarian spirit also helped to foster a new kind of journalism, focusing on scandal, gossip, crime, and crusades against the high and the mighty. In the midst of this Wild West show, a sense of public service was nevertheless emerging. Idealistic publishers like Horace Greeley at the New York Tribune, James Gordon Bennett at the New York Herald, and Henry Raymond at the New York Times introduced new standards of reporting that stressed accuracy and balance. The invention of the telegraph in 1844 also allowed the press to greatly enlarge its horizons. Armed with this new electronic carrier, newspapers banded together to form news collection cooperatives called wire services. Havas in France was the first then the Associated Press in the United States, and Reuters in England. The wire services were largely responsible for introducing the concept of objectivity to American journalism. Because they had to file stories to hundreds of client papers with different viewpoints, the wire services had to be objective in order to survive. As the AP's Lawrence Gobright put it more than a century ago, my business is to communicate facts. My instructions do not allow me to make any comment upon the facts which I communicate. America's devastating civil war in the 1860s forced more change on the way news was reported and presented. The public's right to know literally became a life or death matter and it put new pressure on newspapers to get it fast and to get it right. The high cost of telegraph time also forced reporters to learn to be brief. With more stories and advertising vying for space in the paper, editors also devised a new format for presenting hard or breaking news. It was called the summary lead. By summarizing the most important information at the beginning of the story, a story could be cut from the bottom and still make sense. The urgency of the war forced headlines to become more informative, too. Instead of saying, important news from the front, the new headline explains the course of battle. Despite the new standards of brevity and objectivity, the highly competitive metropolitan press approached the 20th century with a sensation-driven gusto that came to be called yellow journalism. Strong-willed publishers like William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer fought to attract readers with a spicy diet of sin, sex, and violence. It was intensely personal journalism in which newspapers strove not just to report events but to influence them. Hearst, for example, shamelessly promoted the Spanish-American War. Here, his paper claims that the U.S. warship Maine was blown up by the Spanish, a charge that was never proven to be true. During that conflict, Hearst is said to have told the illustrator Frederick Remington, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. 
This was an age of American muscle flexing, as exemplified by Teddy Roosevelt's big stick policy in foreign relations. News coverage reflected this attitude. The turn of the century was a time of rapid growth in America, largely because of an influx of immigrants from the poorer countries of Europe. The problems of poverty, vividly recorded here by Lewis Hahn, became a prime target of crusading newspapers. Thanks in part to the new technology, the American press was becoming a big and lucrative business. Inventions such as the linotype machine, stereotyping, and the web-fed press allowed rapid and cheap mass production of newspapers. But it was another invention, radio, that would change the course of communication forever. Many predicted that the wireless box would replace the printed word. The print media themselves focused on a more immediate problem, having to compete with the new electronic medium for advertising dollars. But as it turned out, reports of the death of the print media were greatly exaggerated. Newspaper circulation actually continued to climb. Weekly magazines like Time satisfied public appetites for perspective and analysis. The widespread use of news photography did a lot to hold reader interest. Life, the first great picture magazine, demonstrated the power of the photo in World War II. War influenced the press in other ways, too. American journalists weren't used to censorship, but they bowed to it in the national interest. In the interest of national solidarity, many believed that the people should know about the victories, but not the defeats. Others argued that the people had a right to know the plain truth. It's a dilemma that press and government face to this day. After the Second World War, a new and even more captivating member of the media family arrived on the American scene. At first, television saw itself primarily as an entertainment medium. But gradually, TV found its place as a news vehicle. And by the 1960s, it had become a major force in both journalism and public affairs. Unlike the print media, the American broadcast industry has come under some government regulation. To prevent competitive chaos and to regulate limited airwaves, the U.S. government created in the 1930s the Federal Communications Commission, known as the FCC. The commission continues to issue licenses and to prevent monopoly ownership. Censorship is not part of its mandate, however. For the most part, Uncle Sam's involvement in the broadcasting industry has been nonpartisan and unobtrusive. But the question of what constitutes fairness and decency on the airwaves continues to provoke fierce public debate. Over the past two decades, television's graphic and instant coverage of events has earned it the dominant role in public communication. 98% of American homes own at least one TV, and they keep it running an average of seven hours a day. Until recently, three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, set the national agenda for televised news coverage. The advent of the cable news network, or CNN, and the public broadcasting system, PBS, has given Americans more choices. But most observers agree that the battle for ratings, as the network popularity contest is known, has lowered standards of taste and quality in television programming. The impact of electronic journalism on the print media has been profound. Many worry that Americans are even losing the reading habit. But newspapers and magazines are not counting themselves out by any means. Many are trying to adapt to the television age by introducing more color, more graphics, and shorter stories. Although newspaper circulation has stagnated, advertising revenue has declined, 
and some big city papers have gone out of business altogether, there are still more than 1,600 dailies in the United States. Almost every town of any size continues to have its own local paper. Competition is shrinking, however, as a handful of large groups assume ownership of the small, independent newspapers. In many countries, newspapers seek to be a nationwide voice. But the American press has traditionally been a community press, preoccupied with service to its immediate audience. This characteristic of the American press has contributed to the widespread belief that the U.S. media do not pay enough attention to international affairs. This is a criticism of not just the press, but of American attitudes in general. While its news coverage may seem parochial, the American media have become global businesses. Satellite technology has allowed U.S. papers to expand both nationally and overseas. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today can now be read in far-flung parts of the world at the same time. Computers have helped contribute to the salvation of the print media, dramatically cutting production time and lowering costs. Owning a newspaper is still more profitable than most other businesses in America. Because the American press remains so profitable, it is not needed to turn to the government for financial support. This is a main reason why the American media have maintained their independence and still have managed to provide an inexpensive product to their consumers. Despite television's emergence as a primary source of news, the high cost of production and tight time restrictions tend to inhibit journalistic enterprise by the electronic media. It is the print press that continues to lead the pack as the public's main watchdog of government. The Washington Post, for example, earned a Pulitzer Prize for uncovering the Watergate scandal that led to the resignation of a president. The best of American journalism believes in accuracy, fairness, and clarity but there are no laws to require them. For that reason, there is some very bad journalism, too. Public opinion polls reveal concern among viewers and readers about the media's taste for sensationalism, invasion of personal privacy, and bias. Unlike the British, who make a distinction between the so-called serious and the popular press, Americans tend to regard all their news as coming from one source, the media. Press freedom in the United States continues to enjoy the protection of the 200-year-old Constitution. But this freedom does not maintain itself. Its limits are contested almost daily in the courts, in the legislatures, in police departments, in government offices, and in the public mind. Time and again, American officials have tried to prevent publication in advance, to force journalists to reveal their sources, to close government meetings to the press, and the like. By and large, the case for a free press has prevailed. But the threat is always there. And what about protection from the press? Libel law, for one, has provided a powerful antidote to malicious mischief. Even though the courts uphold the right of the press to scrutinize public figures very closely, they have taken pains to protect the rights and reputations of average citizens. When all is said and done, the question remains, is the American press a public trust or is it a business? In fact, it is both. And reconciling these two realities, poses a serious challenge for the American news media. In fact, the definition of news media is itself being transformed, as the lines between information and entertainment have become increasingly blurred in a fiercely competitive marketplace. Dramatic change has taken place inside the newsroom as well. Women and minorities today make up nearly half of all employees in American journalism. No one knows what the industry, 
the profession, or even the news will look like tomorrow. But three centuries have demonstrated one unswerving truth about American journalism. Its fate, first and foremost, is in the hands of the people. Thank you.